Welcome. Welcome today to this panel at the Payment Summit on the cyber, the cyber supply chain security. Um, we're going to be talking about the problem in software supply chains. We're going to be talking about potential solutions. And before we get into all of that, I want to thank uh, our panelists for joining me, uh, Martin Kyle, the moderator of this panel. And we're going to take a moment and uh, hear from each of our panelists uh, a short introduction on why this topic interests them and what the expertise they bring to the topic uh, today is. And we'll start with uh, Oscar Vandermeer. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, so my name is Oscar Vandermeer, and I'm uh, the co-founder of MergeBase. MergeBase's mission is to secure the software supply chain. So obviously, we're very interested in this topic, we, we empower security and development teams to find and reduce the risks from open source software in their applications. And we provide tools for all stages of an application from coding, building, deployment, and running an applications. Thank you, Oscar. And we'll uh, hear from Ray. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Ray. Um, I think I'm the only non-Canadian on this panel right now. Um, so I'm from Florida, and um, I, I work uh, I work as an analyst for Gartner, and I advise C-suites on their digital business strategies and help them create digital ecosystems. So increasingly, a lot of the C-suites have, have been telling me that these ransomware attacks and cybersecurities are becoming the number one um, priorities to, to address. And previously, I actually worked for the fintech industry, and I helped a lot of the fintechs in Latin America and Africa to connect and partner with large banks. So that's me. Great. Thank you, Ray. And uh, we have Imran. Thanks, Martin. Uh, my name is Imran Bashir. I'm a uh, partner and national public sector cyber leader at KPMG. I, uh, our interest, obviously, is keeping our clients safe in all aspects of cybersecurity and making sure we're taking all the measures needed to do so. My personal interest, too, is, you know, having spent the last 10 years before joining KPMG in the federal government uh, and working with Eric, who'll introduce himself next, wanting to make sure that the public sector is safe in this uh, realm as well. So I'm now on the other side trying to help uh, implement it. So thanks for having me. No problem. And finally, we have uh, Eric. Uh, please introduce yourself, Eric. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, I'm Eric Zayon. I'm the director for uh, security architecture at the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, our our organization is a single point of focus for the federal government uh, uh, to provide advice, guidance, and services uh, to the government, as well as critical infrastructure sectors on all matters cybersecurity. And of course, uh, software security and supply chain security are chief concerns uh, in that space for us. Happy to be here. Well, we're great to, it's great to have all of, all of these esteemed panelists with us today. So I'm just going to tee up the, the topic and we're going to describe kind of what uh, what we're talking about and you know why is it relevant uh, in a payments context uh, for a payments uh, uh, summit well uh, essentially software runs everything right it runs uh, our lives our daily lives but it also it runs payment systems it runs uh, online banking it runs your automobiles it it's really everywhere. So I'm going to throw up a, a couple of slides to introduce this topic just so that we can get a sense of, of what uh, the current state is and what the problems are before we get into the, the panel discussion. Um, so what we'll see here uh, initially is, you know, a couple of news articles I clipped out. One was from a few years ago, so you know that this isn't a brand new issue. Um, but one was just from a few days ago, um, so that you know that this is a very important and topical issue. Uh, so you know, a few years ago, uh, and certainly this wasn't the first type of supply chain attack, but a few years ago they noticed that uh, the open source components that are included in software that gets uh, assembled is uh, those open source components can be a vector in by bad actors to um, manipulate and uh, you know uh, introduce vulnerabilities into software. But even recently, uh, there was an executive order from President Biden on uh, in response to uh, some supply chain attacks uh, recently, um, the Solar Winds attack you may have heard of. 
And in the executive order, there's a significant section on securing the software supply chain. And the National Institute of Standards in the United States is currently in the midst of workshops to address this very important and critical problem. So what is, you know, what is this supply chain problem? Well, we have this graphic here, which is, is kind of nice to, to show. Um, a piece of software, it, it actually is a compilation of a whole bunch of things. And Oscar, I know you provided this, and I wonder if you can kind of frame the problem uh, for us. Sure. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, so if you, this is a kind of a prototypical application. So, I, you know, if you look at modern software practices, it really relies a lot on code reuse because if you have developer yourself or, or your software supplier has developers, you want them to focus on solving the business problems. And you don't want them to focus on low level things like for instance, accessing databases or, or you know, the, the plumbing of building cool user interfaces. So you want to reuse a lot of code. And so a typical modern application for 80 to 90% consists of components that developers have embraced and, and are reusing to really speed up development and to lower the cost of development. And then the, the top 10, 20% of the code is really focused on solving a particular business problem. And that's where the, where the value is. Now these underlying components that you're reusing, they've been created by others. And so that's really where that supply chain is. It could be you know, by, by your vendor or your vendor could have actually sourced them from somewhere else, but uh, to a large extent, they are open source components that are bundled in somewhere along the way towards you know, your organization. And uh, unfortunately, those components, like any other, could contain vulnerabilities that can be uh, compromised by, uh, uh, by attackers. Great, thank you. Um, also, you know, one of the things that uh, is uh, is is prevalent is the adversarial, um, the set of adversaries that uh, we deal with in in financial services in particular. And um, these criminals, they're looking for needles in the haystack, and those needles are are vulnerabilities that they can exploit on pieces of software. They want to get in and uh, make use of that. But the software is compiled by so many parts, it's, it's really hard to keep track of it all. Um, and that is, is a problem. So I wonder um, here, we'll kind, of, we'll kind of switch gears for a moment and I'll ask uh, the panelists, um, what, um, what types of attacks or impacts have we, have we seen in the software supply chain space? Maybe I'll, I'll kick, kick this question off to uh, Eric. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, I think what we've seen, uh, you know, in general is that uh, cyber threat actors uh, will target uh, those specific components uh, of software or other hardware or other uh, uh, you know services as pipelines to uh, get into some end uh, targets. Um, supply chain compromises they can occur. Uh, the advantage, you know, if you look at it from a, an adversary's perspective, uh, they can occur before the delivery of a product or be delivered through a software update, and then they can affect millions of, of endpoint or end customers uh, in that fashion. In 2020, we've uh, published at the Cyber Center our National Cyber Threat Assessment, and it does state some uh, recent examples, uh, some since COVID, uh, others predating this. Uh, and one example that I, I, I'd like to mention is the um, is uh, during the pandemic we saw some cyber threat actors gain access to a large uh, network of hospitals, uh, compromising the IT network, uh, uh, ICS, so uh, uh, specific uh, applications or specific devices, uh, including imaging products and things of that nature, uh, with common uh, uh, vulnerabilities that were found within some of the operating systems of some of those components. Uh, the end result or end target is the hospitals or the healthcare institution and the compromise of that data or even uh, delay uh, resulting in you know delays of, of procedures or surgery or compromise of patient information. 
Uh, and we've seen some of those. Um, FBI has issued some uh, some uh, well-known warnings on multiple occasions on some supply chain compromises in this space. And I would encourage you to uh, read through our national cyber threat assessment to get a little bit more background and references on on those uh, events recently. That's great, uh, I, Imran. I wonder if you have uh, something you wanted to add. Yeah, well, I mean, everything Eric said is, is bang on uh, as usual. I, I, you know, I think it goes back to the analogy that we always use in cyber in that you're only as strong as your weakest link. Uh, and there is a chain of trust here. And, and that chain is just extended as we, you know, with the advent of cloud and more software libraries being available. And, you know, back in the day when you'd buy one piece of software and might buy one vendor, it was all in one place. And that was hard enough to defend as it was. And now, you're dealing with software that's you know that's baked in as as the previous two guys have mentioned with a whole bunch of other components that are split up. It's a, it's a difficult problem to solve, and the bad guys are getting smarter too. You know, as as Eric mentioned, they're not just tackling that one piece of software. They're thinking, well, if I can get one piece of software that's linked to 17 other different things that then and has automatic kind of distribution capabilities, like an automatic update, for example, that's a better bang for buck on their end. So you're seeing them target distribution pipelines and development pipelines. Because quite honestly, that's easier for them to make bigger return on their investment if you think of it from that perspective. So it is quite, it is quite worrisome from from there. Um, and I, I think there is this ongoing. I heard the word open source mentioned a bit as well. And I don't want this to turn into, you know, an open source versus closed source debate either. I think there are pros and cons to both, and there are situations uh, where both are useful. But I think they both face the same issues. Commercial providers and their proprietary code have been, you know, compromised just as much as the open source as well. So I think it's something we all have to stay vigilant on and, and not forget that these bad people take advantage of the fact that even though we know what a vulnerability, we as a community or a culture have a difficult time patching that vulnerability in time. So they're playing on those odds as well that not only can they find the vulnerabilities before us, but they can exploit them before we can corral our you know very scarce resources to rectify them. So it's quite a challenging space. So I, I wonder, you know, who's responsible for a, a a vulnerability or an exploit on a piece of software is it the is it the purchaser or the who implements that software or is it the manufacturer who creates that software application now that's a tough question it, it, it is i'll start by just saying i, I love my answer if it depends uh, but it's it's honestly all all of the like if, here's the challenge like it's not like, uh, I'm trying to think of an analogy, like the car industry where you reuse mufflers when you're building the same car across your chain. And you know if there is a, someone finds a weak uh, link in the muffler that's found over time and then rectified by recalls, cyber moves way, way more quickly than, than the hardware space. And I think the challenge is at the time of manufacturing, everything can be 100% tip top shape. And 10 minutes later after it's out the door, it's not. So I think there's a mutual responsibility, one on the manufacturer to recognize that their job is not done when the product is pushed out and that they must remain vigilant and constantly monitoring for vulnerabilities. And then two, on the other end, keeping alert on monitoring the status of that product and doing your part on the other end to patch it and update it, just as you are responsible to bring your car in when the recall is, is submitted. Now, Ray, I think that's we'll go hard. ahead, Eric. Uh, Martin, uh, like I, I, you know, I think it's really a shared responsibility. But uh, you know, to your uh, your your, your uh, imperative of of knowing what in full detail what your complete supply chain is, both software and and, and traditional, uh, to be able to deliver the best you know the best product, the available available products as well. And so having that that knowledge of what goes into those uh, those software uh, components and services that you're, you're then uh, reoffering, uh, and it. it, it takes that partnership across that that ecosystem of suppliers and, and, and clients to 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 know that. So I would say the responsibility is is, is the, you know distributed amongst amongst everyone playing here. Yeah, I, I do think um, that if you ask about responsibility in that supply chain, that there is a fundamental difference between this typical supply chain that we're seeing with software and, and say traditional supply chains, right? Because this of this open source component and I I agree very much with Imran. We don't want to make this closed source versus open source. I think open source has one. I mean, in general, open source provides more value in in that in that process. And I think there's this famous quote from Larry Allison. You know, Larry Allison being kind of the 
from the prime example of closed source software. And his quote is, open source, uh, when once open source software gets good enough, competing with it would be insane, right? And so, yeah, so open source essentially has one, but that it creates a problem in this, you know, this chain of trust where you, you basically trust your supplier and you can enforce your policies and standards potentially on your, on your suppliers contractually that stops with open source because open source is created for free and it's given to someone either to yourself as an organization or to one of your suppliers. And so you can't easily extend that traditional way of, of uh, having building that chain of trust to open source suppliers, but on the other hand, they're critical in this whole ecosystem. Yeah, I, I do want to add. I, I do want. I, I do. I do agree with everyone, but I do want to add that I think um, customers, the end customers, actually tend tend to blame, um, you know, whoever is their, their immediate uh, touch, you know, the company that actually handles the customer relationships more than, um, you know, all the other software companies that are further down the line. So I, I do think that it is a shared responsibility and increased transparency across this this ecosystem is very important. But um, at the same time, I think, you know, the one that, that actually handles, um, you know, these customer relationship needs to put more kind of iterative approach to mo to constantly monitor those newer uh, increased risks than maybe the more traditional kind of approach of doing a certification up front. So that's, you know, the, you're, you're sliding into a great topic area, which is what is, what does success look like in this area? Or what is, what is a good software supply chain look like? And I wonder if we can kind of start with uh, Oscar on this question. Uh, is there anything, for example, we could learn from traditional supply chains or is software supply chain uh, security completely different. Uh, what does is, what is good look like? Yeah, so, well, I think in general, good looks like, if we look at traditional supply chains, I think we don't really think about it too much. I mean, that's, that's to a large extent what good looks like. You know, uh, we trust our suppliers and we have frameworks in place that kind of make that work in general. Uh, even though they have, you know, there's attacks in traditional supply chains as well. It's not something that is going to hit, you know, the front page of the newspaper on a on a daily basis or creates an executive order, you know, in the U.S. Right. So, um, that I think to a large extent that's what good looks like is when you can just trust it. And I think, uh, of course, in the digital space, we're still an industry that is that is quickly maturing, and we haven't really reached that level yet. So I think. Uh, there's a lot of work that still needs to happen in the next few years to really mature kind of the uh, controls and, and processes uh, around software creation that uh, to, to reach, reach that state. Yeah, I, I think I totally agree. I think a big area of improvement is just on the, the nature of how honestly we still do security. Security to me still feels very siloed from everything else. And in any organization I've worked in, and we always say, Security is enabler, security is this, security is part of all the conversations. We say that really well. I don't think we implement that really well. And like I go, I did computer science, you know, back uh, many years ago in university, and, and I never heard the word security once throughout my the development process. And my, my concern is that we are raising developers to not have security first mindsets. And I know there are changes in that space, but to me, that kind of Venn diagram between what security practitioners do and developers do needs to kind of overlap a bit more and and that's that's the onus on both the developer side to be more security conscious and security people to be more development conscious and i think that will help uh you know instill some of these best practices from the outset that's a really great point i uh I do value uh, on my teams the uh, the ability to understand uh, code or uh, development practices. They don't have to be a, a currently practicing a developer, but um, having that context um, or that understanding of how code is is created, how libraries are assembled into functioning software, um, that's very critical from a security perspective. This is what's you know, what the industry terms uh, shifting left, right? So we're not only shifting left in in our, you know, testing or, you know, establishment of requirements, but we need to shift left in the knowledge of the people um, that, are, that are producing uh, applications and software for us. So I wanted to share um, 
a quick experience. I mentioned the, this executive order at the top of, of the, the panel. And um, the executive orders in the US, they, they come with a huge amount of momentum. And I've been part of that uh, yesterday and will be part of that later today. The National Institute of Standards has um, kicked off a workshop series with um, over a thousand participants. And this workshop series is focused on securing the software supply chain. And it's a direct response to the executive order. And they have a 30, 60, uh, 90 day plan and uh, even 180 and 365 day plan. But to have to, to see that amount of momentum, uh, you know, come and that amount of focus uh, on the software su supply chain problem is amazing. And even just yesterday, I, I learned about uh, so many different initiatives that have, that are that are existing to help this particular problem. And, and one of those initiatives was called the Software Bill of Materials or SBOM. And it's really about enumerating all of the components in your software. So we've, we can't really we can't really tell what to protect or what to defend against unless we have a really good understanding of what's included in a piece of software, and that's where the software uh, bill of materials uh, kind of work um, has been uh, brought to the forefront in this uh, National Institute of Standards workshop. So I you know I wonder um, I wonder from a Canadian perspective what what is um, our what are our efforts uh, within Canada on um, clarifying what's included in a piece of software? Uh, maybe I'll kick that off with uh, Eric. Uh, yeah, and I think that's a really uh, a very uh, important effort that's that's now started uh, uh, and progressing in, in uh, the United States uh, around NIST. Of course, a lot of the work we do in Canada, uh, guidance we provide, our fundamental frameworks are all aligned to the NIST, whether they're the traditional uh, ones that we publish, uh, the, the ITSG 33 guidance that we have, or uh, the cloud uh, the cloud security uh, um, uh, assessments and efforts that we're uh, involved in uh, uh, align really closely and track with the NIST framework. Uh, on, software, uh, on software security, uh, I think this is where um, you know, to be honest, we're, we're, we're catching up on the scope of the problem and, and how to tackle those dependencies within the communities that develop uh, software, both in Canada and, and with our, our partners. Uh, I, I, I would say that uh, the, 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 one of the, the critical issues uh, is, um, for example, uh, we, we have, I think, a, a very solid uh, collaboration with NIST when it comes down to uh, looking at cryptography and looking at validating uh, encryption modules. So those those uh, those pieces of software and hardware and hybrid components that serve to encrypt things and protect the most sensitive data that we have. And we we have the common um, we have a, a, a crypto module validation program that we run in Canada, uh, you know, with NIST and that certify things to FIPS 140-2, for example, or three and those recognized components are, are, are key to, to knowing that when you import a module into your software and you're using crypto, if you do import a module that is certified, you're, you, you, you know that that's been tested and certified. But to Ray's point earlier, and I think Imran to some extent, we need to, to accelerate this, this life cycle, right? So knowing the scope of the problem and as well as being able to quickly update uh, the situation in terms of what goes into those software components or services that you're getting from your cloud provider and so forth and so on. So I think it's it's a growing uh, it's a growing effort in, in Canada to put out this guidance and to work with developers to uh, to continue to to up uh, up the best practices in this space. Thanks. I'm you know uh, I'm just gonna throw up a, a quick slide here. Um, and uh, for those who came to, to kind of see what uh, this has to do with um, food labeling, this was you know one uh, possible solution um, to this problem. There are many solu possible solutions, but you know we have uh, strong supply chain management in the, the food industry. Uh, we have labeling standards, we have inspection standards, we have 
um, all sorts of things. And I've kind of taken this on as a bit of a personal uh, project. Um, and I've, look, I've looked at um, examples of software and I've tried to come up with a, a way to, to label um, software uh, to expose what's inside of it and what vulnerabilities exist there. You know, where in the world was that software created? You know, where did the, the source code come from? Or is the source closed or open? You know, what, what security claims are associated with this software? So there's a lot of things on this example. Um, and it, it borrows from the metaphor of having a food label. As I mentioned, this is just kind of one idea. This is something that I've voluntarily uh, created for a software that I'm interested in. Um, and it's, it's uh, interesting to see uh, the work going on in the United States and the bringing together of many similar initiatives into hopefully a solution that will be standardized and used by um, an industry and certainly uh, for procurement within uh, the U.S. government. So, uh, you know, if we take a look at software supply chain and possible solutions, you know, there's there's a real spectrum here. Voluntary standards, and I just showed you one that that I voluntarily uh, worked on and um, and created. But there are industry standards, uh, the open source scorecards, or the software bill of materials external certifications, um, you know, when in, in procurement for um, highly sensitive, high secure uh, defense oriented uh, software, bespoke software, um, they often have to go through something called the common criteria uh, certification, which is a, a very thorough audit of the development practices, et cetera, of the organization that produces the software. Um, and then there's a question of, you know, how much should the government uh, be involved in enforcing um, standards in this space? Is government regulation an answer to, to uh, managing the software supply chain problem? It certainly was the answer in, in the food supply chain. Um, and what about... Uh, looking at contracts that organizations have with software vendors. You know, the, the liability associated with a, a software manufacturer is, um, is often very one-sided unless it's bespoke software. So this is a couple, a couple things to, to consider. And I want to kind of start uh, some discussion on, on these topics. Does, Let's, let's start first of all with the question, does regulation on cybersecurity work in the financial industry? Now I'm gonna kick this one off to Imran. Yeah, I've got a whole bunch of thoughts, but I'll try to keep them, uh, I'll try to keep them contained here. Um, so, so look, like re regulation, regulation works to some degree in a whole bunch of other fields. And I think regulation works in fields where things are not as dynamic as we just talked about the cyber domain is. If, if you look at some of the most heavily regulated sectors in, in cyber, even going back to like the late 90s, early 2000s, I think health, health might have been one of the first sectors to be heavily re regulated. They still have breaches. And that's not because they don't you know, necessarily do security well. I, I worry about um, what, what, what the, the goal of regulation is compliance. And, and you're not incentivized to go above and beyond, you're incentivized to check the box. And, and that doesn't necessarily make good cybersecurity. I think it sets a good bar and maybe a, a low bar, uh, if I can say so, for, for basic uh, or baseline hygiene. I don't think it sets the right bar or incentivizes the right behavior. And, and just because you have a control doesn't, and just because you're compliant, obviously doesn't mean you're 100% you're cyber safe either. So I, I think compliance work, probably works better in food because in your example, like the, the grams of fat or the grams of protein or the sugar is not changing uh, over the course of that life cycle of, of that food uh, element. The challenge with cyber is that it changes, like I said, on a daily and sometimes hourly basis. So hard for regulators to keep up, hard for the requirements to keep up. I'm not saying, it, you know, ditch it all together. I think you gotta find the right balance of regulation to some degree and then advice, guidance and support to help going above and beyond that particular bar. And, and the last thought I'd leave it before I, I shut up for a second is, 
is just the impact that regulation has on, as we talked about, an already scarce work environment. You have cyber people that are struggling to keep up already. And, and you know, having come from a, a government and, and, and an organization that, that did some internal, quote unquote, oversight or regulation, uh, it, it's, it's a burden also on the employees as well to have to spend time responding to these types of things. So there's a balancing act to find there. And I don't have an answer for you, but it's certainly a balance between what's enough on the compliance side and what's enough on the actual implementation and mitigation side. You know, I know, Ray, you worked in the, the fintech space and um, you must have uh, had to bump up against some regulation at times. Uh, uh, did you feel the regulatory, regulatory burden in that space? I think it, it would really depend on um, how the regulation is designed, because I think in the fintech space, um, I'm, sh I'm, I'm pretty sure that most people are familiar with open banking, which actually and, and also GDPR, and so and also PSD two. So that actually passed down a lot of the risks onto the end customers. That actually allowed the software companies, the fintechs, to actually uh, share data and integrate a lot of the capabilities with the, the more more regulated traditional banking industry. So in that case, I think the regulation depend, you know, based on how it was designed, actually increased innovation in a whole sector and, and promoted more uh, partnerships and collaborations between the fintechs and the banks. But obviously, if I would say that if the regulations were going to pass down a lot of the risks onto the fintechs and the software companies, then, you know, then, then they would you know, spent a lot more resources and time to kind of doing a lot of the understanding and analyzing these regulations. Um, and they would they would have less time to focus on their products and services. And that would probably stifle the innovation and probably would also, you know, drive a lot of these smaller players out of the market just because they can not bear the risk. So then the bigger players like Microsoft and Oracle and, and the others might actually, you know, uh, gain some market uh, competitiveness, depending on, again, depending on how the regulation is designed. So that's an age old question, I guess. Does regulation stifle innovation or does it foster innovation? I, I, I'm sure Amron has a lot to say on this, but I can also share. <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't know a lot of good examples where regulations really has, has accelerated innovation. <laughs> Yeah. I agree. It, it's tough. Yeah, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll maybe ahead. I'll just comment. And I, I I am not. You know, I, I'll I'll caveat that we are not regulators, though we do sometimes work uh, in in partnerships to provide guidance and, and advice on a technical perspective with some regulators. Uh, I would, uh, I, you know, I I I would um, say that I I have talked to to folks who who do see a a side of the uh, regulation coin to say that. There will be some form of incentivization for perhaps developers or people that will supply into that into that space. So by setting a, a regulatory requirement, uh, there will perhaps emerge technology that will come and answer that need, the need for continuous improvement or, or a software bill of material. If I'm if I'm carrying your example, Martin, in terms of uh, perhaps having something that automates that for your for your software uh, development pipeline and makes it makes it uh, faster. So I would say possibly, you know, in some cases. That that regulation, putting it in in that smart way, uh, back to Ray's point in terms of of, of having having something that that is applied, it, it, the compliance is applied in a in a, in, a, in a helpful, possibly fashion, uh, might might help innovation in that sense. Yeah, like yeah. I, I think if it if it makes you look the the challenge I have, and obviously I'm I'm pretty opinionated on this topic. The challenge I have in regulation is that it's very um it's very pass fail, and very binary. And, and cyber is very much not, it's very risk management oriented. And so the pass fail aspect, kind of looking backwards at a control, whether you had one or not, versus how are you preparing, how are you sustaining a, a continuous risk management environment to me is, is if you can regulate that, again, I don't have an answer. I have a lot of opinions, no answers here, but if you can regulate that and getting good behavior, good practices and people constantly looking at threat environments and constantly adapting controls and regulate that type of behavior, I'm all in. I am just kind of against the traditional kind of control-based regulation. Like, do you have X control implemented, yes or no? Doesn't make you 100% secure. Nothing does, really. I think it's about risk management practices. Sure. sure. 
So I'm, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and, and talk about one of the other potential levers in improving uh, software supply chain security. And that is the question of liability. Um, you know, uh, when as, as procurers of software, um, there's certain software that is, I guess, mass distributed, and you probably don't have a lot of uh, flexibility in negotiating the contracts for that that type of software then there's other software which may be uh, bespoke or you know custom uh, written and designed for you uh, where you do have more leverage in uh, uh, setting the terms uh, the contractual terms of the software but it, it seems to me that there's kind of this egregious bias in most end user license agreements where the software manufacturer takes on zero, li zero liability. Um, what would be the consequence if that shifted? Would it actually uh, improve security overall? Um, but would it come at the expense of, let's say, innovation, as Ray had mentioned, if there's too much... Uh, a burden, um, would it create a barrier to entry uh, for small players to innovate uh, in the economy? Now, maybe I'll kick that off to Oscar, since uh, Oscar, you represent uh, kind of a, a growing technology company. Um, and uh, I'm sure you have uh, kind of software liability uh, on in your agreements. Yeah, yeah and, and, and li the liability question, I think we're, we're talking here in the payments uh, summit is also very much aligned with kind of how things are, are done in the payments industry, right? Because in the payments industry, you've got processes of payments and, you know, what type of liability do they take on, for instance? So if somebody processes an AFT transaction for, uh, you know, one or two cents, how much liability are they going to accept? Because it could be a 10 million, $20 million transfer. Um, so in general, they don't accept uh, in those type of circumstances a lot of liabilities, but in other business models, like say for instance, credit cards, where the fee that the, the credit card processor or uh, the bank charges is actually a percentage of the total amount, you know, they are actually uh, taking on quite a bit of the risk. So I think, so I think there's um, an alignment between the business models and the type of liability shift or, or, or risk sharing that you can create. And so in the software industry, we often, if you buy Microsoft Excel, as an example, uh, you pay, you know, uh, perhaps uh, you know, 40 bucks a year for that for one license. And Microsoft is not going to take on a lot of liability for if it basically, for instance, produces an error and, and you, you have a, you know, $100 million calculation error in, in that software, they can't take on liability for that with that business model so i think there's so if you if you if you change the liability shift and you regulate that and you essentially will force other business models on the industry and so then the question becomes what's the pros and cons of introducing or forcing the industry to different business models um, and, and i think uh, imran already mentioned that this is a very dynamic industry and, and so constraining the, the business models that can be used in the industry it's not necessarily something that is, is uh, you know, uh, have, will have a positive effect in general. Yeah, it's, it's quite a tightrope to walk. I mean, it, I think you have to go, I guess you have to get down to what behavior you're trying to like create or incentivize. And I think what I think what we're trying to say here is some software manufacturers may be rushing too fast to market and, and putting security behind. If you want to incentivize the behavior of baking security and there is certainly some elements you can do there. I worry about, and this is the pendulum part. If you go too far one end, I think I think you do absolutely stifle innovation. I think you you put all the blame on one company. The company's going to be so risk averse, not put anything out, and then everything kind of comes to a crawl. I, I, there almost has to be, and I'm going back to my car analogy again, and maybe it doesn't work, but you know the the car gets put out, but but if something is as egregious as like the brakes don't work or your seatbelts don't buckle or something crazy, they are accountable to bring it back and fix it. And maybe it's 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 the level of, of, of vulnerability or the degree to which uh, they can own responsibility for versus some of the stuff that is naturally going to occur. And I'm going to use wear and tear as the example of the car. I don't know what the equivalent is in the software world, um, but but that type of like analysis on what what is the type of thing you can actually hold someone accountable for and incentivize the behavior of being secure to market instead of first to market, um, but without kind of stifling innovation. So interesting tightrope again to walk. 
doesn't seem there's a, a clear answer. Certainly from from Ray's story earlier as well, we know that uh, um, she echoed your comments, Imran, where in the fintech uh, space, if there's so much regulation or maybe so much of, of a barrier to entry on the liability question, there wouldn't be uh, a lot of innovation against uh, against the open banking APIs or or other opportunities for for growth. Um, Ray, I don't know if you have anything else uh, to comment on on that topic. Yeah, I think I think I definitely echo with um, everyone's opinions here, and and I think that it, there there's definitely I, I think it depends on how regulation is designed and what kind of problem that they're trying to address. So I think that pinpointing to the underlying issue, the bigger risk of the most common, um, the most commonly identified risk, and then set the regulations instead of just trying to come up with a one size kind of fit all that type of regulation. I think that would be the key. All right. Um, we, we've got a couple of questions coming in from, from the, uh, uh, from the audience, and um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a couple of these, and we're gonna start taking some questions at this time. Um, the first one is: Are there specific types of attacks to be aware of in the in the software supply chain? Specific types of attacks. So let's see, Oscar, it looks like you've got a response for that one initially. Yeah, there's, yeah, I think there's definitely specific types of, of attacks. So the, the most prevalent attack is that you're using software libraries in your application. You might actually not even be aware that, that your application has all these libraries in them. And then these, uh, these libraries have no vulnerabilities. And, and so there's actually exploits that are readily available for adversaries to use and they can use that to essentially breach that particular library in your application and break in. So that's one typical approach. The other one, which is typical, is, is basically go at a downstream provider and SolarWinds, which was a huge uh, breach earlier this year or late last year, uh, wherever, you know, I think uh, 18,000 companies were essentially breached because their supplier uh, was breached. And so it's, you're, you're, implicitly trusting your suppliers, but um, they might be much easier to target than the than high, highly defended organizations themselves. And so organizations like Homeland Security and Microsoft were essentially uh, breached because of uh, because one of their uh, software suppliers was breached. And with a routine update, they essentially brought in uh, vulnerable components into the organization that, uh, that essentially siphoned off a lot of data. All right, uh, Eric, um, I saw you might have uh, uh, a response to that. What specific types of attacks could happen to the software supply chain? Yeah, and actually I agree with Oscar and very important points there about uh, also these, these, these trust relationships and third party uh, inputs become very uh, important. And, and, and sometimes it's not an exploited vulnerability, like an actual software flaw. It might be a trust relationship that's not uh, up to date uh, that that's been left hanging, if if you will, and by providing a third party with uh, more trust than is required or for a longer period, uh, that may be another vector that 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 people can take to 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 get in. And we've kind of uh, uh, we've kind of uh, uh, approached the issue a little bit uh, through one of your earlier questions, Martin. But with the advent of of cloud providers and everything moving to the uh, as a service model, not everything, but a lot of things moving to the as a service model where uh, suppliers of, of software functionality are often delivering it to you as a, a prepackaged deal that lives on a, a large scale cloud providers. There are many components in there and we have there again a, a shared responsibility model for uh, the, for the, the risks that we're seeing uh, there. So in a, in, a, for an, in a cloud provider, for example, uh, the cloud provider is responsible for, for the security of, of, of their platform, uh, but you as a user will be responsible for, for a component of that or, or a component of the security of the data that you put into the platform. So having that, that shared model, and then when you enter MSPs and third-party providers into that, you've got to kind of understand that whole uh, ecosystem that's supplying you your your functionality. Um, 
to so those are the types of of of, of supply chain attacks i think that that we should kind of wrap our heads around that makes me think of uh, two two key principles one being transparency transparency of your responsibilities versus your vendors uh, and then if you're a vendor or software manufacturer transparency of of what's included in in your supply chain relationships and then the second principle accountability so transparency and accountability i think are really two key um, principles that uh, that you've highlighted so i'm going to move to another question um, and question two uh, the next question is in terms of responsibility for software vulnerabilities uh, given software's critical nature should the government regulate the software manufacturer? I think we've kind of danced around this question a little bit. Maybe a quick answer from each of the panelists. Uh, Oscar, should government regulate the software manufacturer? I think we just talked about it. I don't see how you can do that in a simple way that is that is effective. And, and we keep talking about, you know, if you talk about carrot and stick about the stick approach, Perhaps you know we also need to look at the carrot approach. Can we create some incentive for for developers and open source developers to you know to produce more secure code? And I think they're proud about producing high quality products. So perhaps we should play into that. Yeah, Imran, your your uh, short answer on regulating the software manufacturer. Yeah, I, I fully agree with what Oscar said. I, you know, if, if there was a, I think about a return on investment. The amount of money it will take to develop the regulation and spend to to continually maintain it i would rather see that money invested in helping these organizations raise their cybersecurity posture so if there were a choice between the two i'd rather invest in the thing that helps actually raise the posture and defend against the attacks versus the more checklist approach uh ray what's your opinion on should the government regulate software manufacturers I think I would probably reframe the question as it's not a, a whether question, but a how question. So it's more about how government actually regulates these uh, software manufacturers. And so it's not really a black and white answer. It's it's more about how they can actually just enough to prevent these um, kind of really high risk kind of um, risks, but then also not not too much. So that would stifle the information and the whole um, the whole industry. And Eric, what's your take on regulation of the software uh, manufacturer? I'll agree with my colleagues. I, I, I think the if if I think of open source, for example, I think of all the multitude of hybrid components that go in into there. I would say smart uh, collaborative components, incentivizing and, and smart compliance for some regulations of of as you said before, some sensitive contracts or or some. Uh, some uh, some critical infrastructure sectors uh, working with the regulators to ensure that suppliers into there have those best practices and are incentivized to do it rather than uh, the regulation specifically on the on the provider side. I see there was an uh, amendment to the question, which actually uh, you addressed, which is perhaps um, it's not. Uh, regulating maybe perhaps the government doesn't regulate all software manufacturers but those that provide critical software or a strategic or critical uh, market and and that's actually quite interesting because the very first phase of the these nist workshops that that i mentioned earlier is to identify within the u.s federal government what are the critical pieces of software that they want to create this scope for um, is it operating systems or is it uh, financial systems or is it some other type of transactional system? And so I think there is a probably, uh, well, there's clearly credence to, to uh, clarify the problem. All right, so we've just, uh, let's see, we've got another, another question here. Food labeling is a great idea for cyber supply chain, but I see this benefiting the company that is creating the consumer products can a general consumer really benefit i feel like there's a lack of awareness what are your views uh and then going on comparing with the food industry people have become more aware of what is in their food and asking more questions how can we get there in cybersecurity? Uh, so it's a kind of a question around uh, awareness and, you know, um, it's a complex field. 
to talk about the components inside your software, how is that really going to translate to a consumer using a piece of software? Any uh, takers on this one? Well, I, I, what, go ahead. I, I, I guess just just a thought. I wonder if maybe um, newer emerging technologies like blockchain and especially the smart contract could actually help bring those transparencies across the supply chain. And because you know, with smart contract, then everyone can actually see what's behind um, each of these products. Uh, you know, who actually produced the software, and and there's an actually a, a contract there. So I wonder if maybe. Um, some of the smart um, contracts mechanisms can actually be more widely used to to solve this awareness problem for the consumers. All right, um, Eric, you had some comment. What what about the awareness and trying to understand this complex space at, at a consumer level? Yeah, and I would say that, uh, and I don't know how far we can draw the analogy, but if we look at the regulated sectors, if we look at government and then we look at the regulated uh, sectors, you know, the, the telecoms, the financial industry, energy, transport, uh, as we're working to perhaps uh, sh to perhaps shore up the, the the software supply chain in 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 those in those spaces and work with providers. Uh, there may be ripple effects there uh, if we if we work with the large hyperscale cloud providers, for example, and and, and we look at the, the the security equation in that space and we make those practices better in some way. Uh, one of my hopes is that that also translate to the consumer product space, uh, but of course it's it has to be coupled with awareness uh, campaigns with with more uh, specific things that will not that will not hit necessarily, necessarily big uh, CI components, but that would have an impact on either small businesses or uh, or, 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 or individuals as well. Yeah, I, I think we have to get to a place where the burden is not on the consumer. Like I, when I turn on my light switch in my house, I'm not worried that it's going to light on fire every time because I know the whole thing's kind of inspected the whole way through and the switch is CSA approved and everything else. I know that's not a perfect analogy, but I want that peace of mind for, for electro IT equipment as well. When I buy a router, when I buy a laptop, when I, like I'm a nerd, I'm tinkering with the firmware and stuff. My, my mom doesn't care about that stuff. She just wants to work and stay secure. And if it's not secure, automatic update. I think automation plays a huge role in this as well. That this stuff shouldn't be. We still, even to this day, in our workplaces, we still have these optional updates or snoozing abilities, and we have to get past this. This like these things aren't optional anymore. These things are mandatory for our own health and safety, um, and that's not kind of overstating the problem because in some cases our own health and safety is actually on the line. And I think the education awareness on that front as to why these things are need to be front and center, need to continuously be updated, is important, but not from a perspective of putting the burden on the end user to be responsible for it. Thank you very much. Uh, I see we're just wrapping up uh, on time, and uh, I want to give I want to give uh, maybe Oscar uh, or Ray a kind of a, a final word or a final say on that particular question, if you have one. Ray. Um. Sure. So, I, I, so so for for the last question, I think yeah, I think. This I think we all see the the complexity of all these issues that we've been discussed. So I think, uh, again, the solutions are not. I, I think I, I think I would want to see maybe more of a collaboration even between the regulators and and the software providers and also the food manufacturing companies to actually sit together and and actually walk through a lot of the issues together. So maybe more more collaborations to come up with better regulations. Um, that, that would be my my wrap up thought. All right. Anything to wrap up, uh, Oscar? Yeah. So I think what the food labeling approach does highlight is is essentially a level of transparency, and then we're talking also about education. And I think a lot a lot more maturing has to happen in the industry. But the, creating some sort of voluntary standard that helps uh, improve transparency, I think, is one of the building blocks to to uh, enhance security and get, you know, make sure that Imran's mom doesn't have to worry about, you know, she turns uh, something on. All right. Well, I'd like to thank the panelists today. It was a very lively and interesting discussion for myself. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope the audience enjoyed it. Um, so thank you very much for participating in the summit. I will uh, mention that there is a brain date uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. on this topic. And just before 
uh, we convened, uh, there were still a couple of spots available if you're interested in this topic. Uh, come on by to the brain date and we'll continue it there. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Uh, have a great day.